everyone, Steve from Backcountry Gallery here. This time around, I'm going to give you a first look review at the brand new Nikon 800mm PF lens exclusively for the Z mount. Nikon contacted me and asked if I wanted to take this new PF lens out for a test drive. Naturally, I said yes, and I can't wait to share my thoughts. However, I do need to note that everything you're about to see and hear in this video was based on a pre-production lens, so there may be slight differences when the finalized version is out. This also means I wasn't able to do my normal battery of tests, so you'll find there are a lot of field impressions in this video, which, I don't know, might actually be better. Now, either way, I do plan to do a more extensive review once I get a production copy. For this quick field test, we drove down to Florida and met up with the Nikon rep. I only had access to the lens for a single rainy afternoon and a couple of mostly overcast hours the next morning. The conditions were tough to say the least. Rainy, dark, heavy overcast, just the kind of situation to really challenge a lens, and man, did this one come through. Also, this first look video is just the beginning. Shortly after this is published, I'll be releasing another video featuring some of the images I took with the 800PF and the story behind them. When it's ready, I'll put a link in the description area on YouTube under this video, but you know what? It never hurts to subscribe so you don't miss out. Finally, before we begin, I want to mention that although Nikon asked me to try the lens, I insisted that the travel expenses were mine. As always, I want to remain neutral so I continue to pay my own way for any and all reviews you see from me. So with all that out of the way, let's jump in. Build-in features. Let's start with the build quality and the features of the lens before we get into how it performs in the field. Build quality is always a bit hard to define, but based on my time with this lens, it seems like it's every bit as durable as Nikon's big primes and more robust than the 300 or 500 PF lenses. It certainly seems rugged enough to keep up with the kind of abuse my lenses have to put up with in the field. I certainly have no fear of using this lens on safari in Africa for weeks on end or during rainy season in the tropics. It feels incredibly durable and all the controls have a solid tactile feel to them. I know that some have voiced concern that, due to the relatively affordable price, the build quality may have suffered. All I can tell you is that if there were any corners cut, I sure the heck didn't see it. The lens is fully weather sealed and even features Nikon's fluorine coating to help repel water droplets and dust. During our rainy afternoon, we really put this weather sealing to the test several times and the lens handled it like a champ. I have a sneaking suspicion it might be able to tolerate more rain than I can. The lens has 22 elements and 14 groups and features an impressive array of acronyms to help deliver the best quality images. It includes both ED, extra low dispersion, and SR, short wavelength refractive glass, as well as nanocrystal coatings. You can look up the specifics for what these are and what they do on Nikon's website, but long story short, they are cutting edge optical technologies that help deliver crisp images free from defects. There wasn't so much of a hint of chromatic aberration in any of my images. All of the controls feel solid and work as expected. The switches feel sturdy and flip into position with a very satisfying click. There are only two of them on this lens though, one for switching between manual and autofocus and a range limiter switch. The range limiter allows you to use either the entire focus range of the lens or limit the focus range to between infinity and 10 meters. This can cut acquisition time down if the camera misses a lock and starts to hunt since it only takes that hunting trip through a limited area of the focus range. I do wish Nikon would consider a close range limiter as well, like from minimum focus to maybe 10 meters. It makes it so much easier when dealing with small close subjects. Although the lens has VR, there is no VR control switch on the lens barrel, and you know what? That's fine by me. For this lens, all VR is adjusted via the eye menu, and personally, I mean, I dislike looking away from the viewfinder to mess with the VR switch anyway. I think the eye menu is actually faster, at least for me. The lens also has programmable function buttons around the front ring and another towards the rear of the lens. Now, I'm a fan of function buttons on lenses, so I'm glad to see this. Also, note that the four function buttons around the front all act as the FN2 button, not four individual programmable buttons. The lens also includes a memory set button on the side that allows you to lock in a set focus distance and recall it with the function buttons. I'm happy to see this feature since I often use it when photographing close, tricky subjects. I simply lock in the focus distance for those subjects and if the camera's AF wanders off target and tries for maybe the background or something, I press a function button to instantly get focus back in the ballpark. The dampening on the focus ring and control ring feel great and hit that sweet spot between easy to turn when you want to, but not so loose that you spin them accidentally. The positioning of these controls threw me off a little at first since all the Z lenses I've owned up to this point have placed the control ring towards the rear of the lens. However, I think I see why Nikon did it this way. The control ring has a very pronounced texture that's easy to find with your thumb while you're peering through the viewfinder. 
If you place your thumb on the control ring and go directly back, you quickly find the focus ring, go forward, and you're on the lens FN2 button. This makes the control ring a very handy index position for the most frequently used lens controls, and I have to say, this was an ergonomic slam dunk. As for size and weight, the lens weighs in at just 5.25 pounds and is 15.2 inches long, and the front diameter is 5.6 inches wide. In these shots, you can see how it compares to the 600 f4 and the 500 pf, both with and without hoods. By comparison, the 800.56 AFS is 10.1 pounds, 18.2 inches long, and has a front diameter of 6.3 inches. So the 800 pf is a major reduction in weight and a nice reduction in size. Oh, and get this, we discovered I could mount it to the Z9 and place them in my Gura Gear Kabuku 30L camera bag, reversed hood and all. As a comparison, the only way my bulkier 600mm fits in the bag is without the camera or the hood. Now speaking of the hood, Nikon came up with a very innovative way to handle hood attachment with this lens. The hood twists into place and engages a little locking mechanism, effectively preventing it from detaching. To release, slide the locking switch and twist. I found it worked well and was more user friendly than the button release we have on like the 500 PF or the 100 to 400 and a more elegant solution than the screw down lock found on my 600 millimeter. I'm not sure how well this mechanism will tolerate grit and sand, but my longer term test is gonna tell us that for sure. In addition, this hood seems a little bit less robust than the one on my 600 F4, but definitely sturdier than the ones for the 300 and 500 PF. The lens also uses a clever 46 millimeter drop-in rear filter that eliminates that annoying little knob on top we have with some of our bigger glass. It's easy to engage and features a handy directional indicator. Although I seldom use polarizers with long glass, this is potentially a nice addition. However, I'm not too sure I'm all that eager to drop two stops of light on an f6.3 lens, so we'll see. The lens's minimum focus distance is 16 feet, resulting in a 0.16 reproduction ratio. As a comparison, the 800.56 AFS lens has a minimum focus distance of 19 feet and a 0.15 reproduction ratio. This is one place where a 600 f4 with a teleconverter will hold an edge. TCs don't reduce minimum focus distance, although we're really only talking a couple of feet here between the 600 millimeter f4 and a TC versus the 800 pf. Finally, the lens collar in the foot. The collar rotation is buttery smooth and the lock is textured nicely and has a really good feel to it. The foot is pretty much standard issue, although I really wish Nikon and Canon and Sony for that matter would consider making these Arca Swiss compatible. At least it does have a comfortable bit of rubber on the grip for carrying though, so there is that. Autofocus, VR, sharpness, and rendering impressions. Since the lens I was using was a pre-production model, I wasn't allowed to comparatively test things like AF speed, VR performance, sharpness, or background rendering against other glass. However, I am allowed to pass along my impressions, so that'll have to do for now. Later, once I have my production copy, I'll probably do a follow-up video to this first look review that will include more detailed information. As a side note, I didn't have a chance to test this lens with my 1.4 teleconverter since I wasn't too eager to face an F9 aperture on a dark overcast day, so that'll have to come later as well. So let's start with AF speed. This lens uses Nikon's STM motors and not the higher end Silky Swift VCM motors. However, it sure doesn't seem like those STM motors are holding it back. My seat of the pants estimate was that it was easily on par with other big primes I've used from Nikon, Sony, and Canon. It was quick, snappy, and scooted from minimum focus distance to infinity impressively fast. If I had to guess, and again, this is just a guess, it seemed at least as quick as my 600 F4. Mounted to the Z9, it seemed to grab targets as quickly and easily as any high-end lens I've used. It's not just quick either, autofocus accuracy was also outstanding. In short, autofocus seems excellent. Of course, AF speed is tough to gauge just by watching the camera focus from minimum focus distance to infinity, so I'll really put this to the test with a production copy. Speaking of autofocus, this is probably a good time to let you know I've recently updated my book, Secrets to the Nikon Autofocus System Mirrorless Edition, to include the Nikon Z9. The Z9, and for that matter, all the Z cameras, bring a ton of new autofocus features, and without a proper understanding of how they work, you'll never get the most from your camera. My mirrorless AF book covers everything you need to know about the Nikon mirrorless system for the Z9, the Z5, 
the Z6, the Z7 series, and the Z50. Every topic is explained in an easy to understand, non-technical language with tons of examples, illustrations, and images. It's really a must have for every Z shooter. Make sure you check it out at my site. I'll put a link in the card above and in the description area on YouTube under this video. Next, let's talk VR. Nikon claims 5.5 stops of VR performance with this lens on a Z9 and 5 stops on a regular Z series camera. Now, the difference is because the Z9 has a more sophisticated IVIS system. Now, full disclosure, I have never been able to get the claimed results from Nikon or any manufacturer. However, this lens seemed better than any I'd ever tried before. Since everyone's ability to handhold with VR varies, I'll give you an idea of how I usually do with it. With my 500 PF, I can shoot reliably at like 1 500th of a second with a nice keeper rate. If I drop to like 320 or 1 250th, the keepers become a little bit thinner and I frankly avoid shooting much under 200th of a second with that lens without a tripod. With my 600 f4e, I can use VR at 1 800th of a second with a good keeper rate. If I drop to 1 500th, I can make it work, but not so great, you know? If I dip much lower than 1 500th of a second, my keeper rate goes right off a cliff. So that's me. With that in mind, I started dropping the shutter speed on the 800 PF just to see what would happen. It's a longer focal length than the other two lenses, so I wasn't sure what to expect. I started off at 1 500th of a second, and I was shocked to discover pretty much every shot was sharp. So I dropped to 1 320th, and most of the shots were still sharp. I finally got as low as 1 200th and still had a surprising number of keepers, and then my bird flew off. Now, I'll admit, this blew me away. 800 millimeter handheld at 1 200th of a second with a good keeper rate for me, that's a big part of why I refer to this lens as a game changer. I never imagined I'd be able to pull off shutter speeds like that hand-holding an 800 millimeter lens. And by the way, this is just me standing there, not braced on a knee or leaning against some kind of support. In fact, I have a feeling I could have gone even lower, especially if I were braced a bit better and still had a very acceptable keeper rate. Again, I only had access to the lens for a very brief time. I'll check this more thoroughly later. However, I'm tentatively going to say that this is the best stabilization I've used with any lens from any brand. Next, let's talk sharpness. Normally, I like to compare lenses against other known good performers, but since this was a pre-production unit, that wasn't an option. However, Based on the images I've captured, it certainly seems like this lens can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Nikon's best big glass. The photos I captured showed detail and sharpness at a level that fit right in with the hundreds of thousands of sharp images I've captured with exotic primes over the years. I could easily see every bump on the skin around the orbital rings of the bird's eyes. I could make out reflections and eyeballs, and feather detail was terrific. This is especially impressive when you consider we were shooting in about the flattest light the sky could offer. In addition, I had situations where the subject's head was towards the edges of the frame and the sharpness still looked fantastic. I've used a lot of different optics for shooting wildlife over the years, most of them exotic primes, and this lens seems like it could go head to head with the best I've seen for sharpness. Again, this is preliminary and I'll do some controlled sharpness tests once I get my production copy. Next, background rendering. One of the concerns with PF glass is that background rendering isn't as good as a normal prime lens. Now, I don't think that's a concern here at all. In fact, one of my favorite things about this lens is the way I see it rendering backgrounds and foregrounds. In fact, take a look at this ibis in the grass and how the sharpness transitions between the foreground, the bird, and the background. And personally, I love the way that looks. In fact, when I got back and started looking through the images I captured, I couldn't help but notice how smoothly all the transitional areas of sharpness rendered and how the backgrounds often seem to take on an almost dreamy look. As much as I'm impressed with the other aspects of this lens, I think rendering, especially those foregrounds and backgrounds, is really what set me over the top on this. Based on what I've seen so far, I think this lens cranks out better backgrounds than even my 600 f4. Oh, and if you like buttery smooth backgrounds, this thing delivers in spades. Find a close subject against a distant background and it'll absolutely destroy every distraction behind that subject. Finally, a quick note on flaring. Sometimes PF lenses can flare when shot directly into the light, but due to the overcast conditions, I just was not able to test this. So we'll add this to the list for the final longer term review. F6.3. If there's one perceived Achilles heel with this lens, it's probably the maximum aperture of 6.3, or at least that's what it seems like based on internet chatter. However, I think those concerns are overblown. 
While I'm not typically a fan of f6.3 lenses, you have to consider that in this case, there isn't a much faster option for something in the 800 millimeter range. No matter how you cut it, f5.6 is as fast as you can go once you start talking about 800 millimeter, and this is only one third of a stop slower. Basically, we're talking about the difference between ISO 800 and ISO 1000. This is fairly easy to compensate for just using shutter speed, and the very potent VR system easily makes up for losing that one third of a stop. Of course, you know, this assumes that the movement you're trying to stop is on your end, and it's not the animal. In addition, you have a much smaller, lighter, and affordable option than any of the 5.6 configurations you can come up with. Well, it's undeniable that there are times where every third of a stop counts. Considering the focal length here, I think the difference in size, weight, flexibility, and cost more than makes up for it. Another concern comes down to background rendering at f6.3 versus 5.6. Now, the truth is, if you can spot a one third of a stop difference in depth of field or background rendering, you have way better eyes than I do. And as I mentioned, I'm already a raving fan of the way this lens renders out of focus areas. Handling. Finally, let's talk handling. I think this is the lens's greatest strength. One of the game-changing aspects of all of Nikon's PF lenses has been their handling in the field, and the 800mm was clearly designed with this consideration at the forefront. First, it's exceedingly well balanced with most of the weight towards the center. In fact, it balanced really well with the Z9. This weight distribution allows you to hold the lens so your arm isn't stretched way out and it reduces fatigue. Although it's about two pounds heavier than the 500PF, the balance still makes it a very hand-holdable lens in my opinion. Sure, after a long duration, I would notice the weight of the lens much more so than something like a 500PF, but it wasn't so much that I was constantly resting my arms. Most of the time, I could hold the lens as long as I needed to. Still, it's not the featherweight that we see with the other PF lenses, so if I was really stuck waiting for something to happen, I would want maybe a monopod or a tripod, but, and I really wanna stress this, for the most part, I'm planning to handhold this lens. In addition, the VR system in this lens seems eager to handle shutter speeds I never considered when handholding an 800mm lens before. If I'm at 800mm and trying to handhold a typical setup, I'm thinking of at least 1 800th of a second and preferably 1 1250th. I mean, there's a reason I usually have a tripod or monopod under my 600mm IntelliConverter. As mentioned, I was knocking out razor sharp images at just 1 200th of a second. In short, this lens begs to be used handheld. The combination of size and weight also allows you to use the lens in tougher, tighter spots where you may not have considered using an 800mm before. I was able to maneuver into tricky spots and quickly get into position far faster with this lens than when using a traditional lens at the same focal length. Plus, the VR allowed me to skip the tripod and that often saved valuable seconds when I needed to capture a fleeting moment. Like the 500PF, this lens allows you to react much faster in the field and get into much better positions. That in and of itself can be the difference between just a nice shot and an absolute stunner. Lenses like this simply help you put more keepers on the cards. Should you get one? The biggest surprise with this lens is the price tag, but in a good way. The lens comes in at $6,500 and it looks like it's gonna start shipping late April. If you're a wildlife photographer and have the budget for it, I think this lens deserves some serious consideration. It was literally designed with wildlife photography in mind, and it shows. I think this would be a welcome addition to the bag of anyone doing birds or small to medium sized mammals, and I think it can also prove handy for larger mammals when you want those tighter, more intimate shots, or when you just aren't allowed or can't get close enough to them. In short, 800mm is a fantastic focal length for wildlife work, and I find myself at 800mm on a very regular basis, very soon with this lens. The thing is, up to this point, using 800mm at any kind of reasonable f-stop involved a combination of big expensive glass, plus that teleconverter, or a dedicated 800mm f5.6 lens, and generally a pretty big tripod to go along with it. Let's face it, setups like that aren't maneuverable, and they can slow you down. That's why I'm calling this lens a game changer. It breaks all the rules and is far more affordable than the big glass options while offering what really seems like the same level of performance. Unless you are always at very close range with your subjects, I think this is a no-brainer for Nikon wildlife shooters. I know I'm adding one to my bag just as soon as I can. However, I don't think of it as a solo lens either. Although it may be your main lens, I also think another shorter optic, like a 500PF or the 100-400, is also good to have in the bag. In addition, 
I know that some of those with 600 f4s are now thinking about swapping that lens for one of these. Honestly, I'm kind of thinking about it too. However, I think I'm going to hang on to my 600 for the moment. In looking over my archives, it does seem like I use 600 millimeter quite a bit. By the way, I'm also seriously considering a Nikon PF setup and giving that a try for the next little while. I think the 300, 500, and 800 PFs might be one of the most versatile, lightweight packages a Nikon wildlife shooter can bring. If I can get my 800 PF before my next Africa trip, I'll give that PF kit a try there and I'll let you know how it goes. So, you know, you should probably subscribe if you want to get that report. Conclusion. At this point, I think you can tell I'm a fan. From the moment the development announcement came out, I've been interested in this lens and I really want to thank Nikon for letting me take it for an early test drive. For the kind of shooting I do, this is truly a game changer. It's sharp, the rendering is some of the best I've seen, the VR system is groundbreaking, and the size and weight make it both easy to handhold in tough spots and easy to transport. Based on my limited time with this lens, and the fact that I kept saying while I was holding it, I can't believe this is 800 millimeter, I really think this is going to change the way I shoot. I think shots that were difficult or even impossible before are now within much easier reach, and it'll be fun to see what this thing can really do. Overall, I'm very impressed and I can't wait to get one in my bag. Also, remember if you're a Nikon Z shooter to check out my ebook, Secrets to the Nikon Autofocus System, Mirrorless Edition, just updated for the Z9. If you're not getting the results from the AF system you want, it's likely because of how new the system is. There's just a lot to know and if you don't fully understand it, your images are going to suffer. Why not destroy that learning curve? For less than the price of a lunch date, you can master the AF system and the Z cameras. Everything is covered in a friendly, easy to understand way that strips away technical confusion. Give it a look. I know you're going to love it. As always, I hope you'll stop by the site and sign up for my free email newsletter so you never miss one of these videos or one of my reviews or one of my blog posts or one of my workshop opportunities. Make sure you get on that free email newsletter. You'll be glad you did. And as always, I hope you'll like, subscribe, and get notified. Thanks again for watching. Have a great day.